All right. Well, welcome back to the Meraki Unbox podcast. This is episode number 48. Can you believe it? My name is Sammy Brenner, and I will be your host taking you through the episode today. Um, if you've subscribed to the podcast, you've likely heard my voice before. I'm back again. I have the opportunity to kind of talk about that human element of networking, which makes me so excited. And uh, we get the opportunity to highlight some amazing folks inside and outside of the Meraki organization. But if you haven't subscribed, please be sure you do that today. Go ahead and click the little subscribe button. Um, that way you'll get automatically alerted when new episodes come out and uh, tell all your friends and family about how amazing uh, the Meraki Unboxed podcast is. And of course, we want your feedback. So if you have podcast ideas or you'd like to be on the podcast or a part of the podcast, please reach out to at Meraki Simon on Twitter. And if it makes sense, we would absolutely love to collaborate with you. So let's get into the fun stuff. I am beyond thrilled to introduce our guest today. Joining us is the president of Cisco Canada on the line. We have Shannon Leigander. I met her actually back in 2020 when she came to the Meraki headquarters to do an office tour. She met the public sector team and she spoke at a Women of Meraki event. And if you haven't had the pleasure of hearing Shannon speak, you are in for a treat today, my friends, because her presence is absolutely magnetic. She has this way of grabbing the audience. And I thought to myself, you know what? I My paths are going to cross with this woman again in my life. I just know it. So March being Women's History Month, I could not think of a better powerhouse to bring on this podcast. So a little bit of background about Shannon. She came to Cisco back in 2007 from IBM. She's been a director at Cisco in the federal space. She was an area vice president for state and local and education for the East. And in September, she took over the role of Cisco Canada president. Welcome to the Meraki Unbox podcast, Shannon. Thank you, Sammy. I'm so excited to be here. If you could see me, you would see me blushing right now. What a great intro. So I'm thrilled. Oh, man. I'm thrilled to oh be here. yay. Oh, my gosh. Well, I'm equally excited. And for no reason, I'm blushing, too, just because I'm fangirling over your presence. But thank you again for making the time to be here today. We really appreciate it. I'm thrilled. Yay. Okay. So let's get into the fun stuff. Now you shared your journey with me before when you came and spoke at Meraki, but for those listeners who maybe aren't as familiar, don't know your background, how did you get to Cisco? What has been your career path up until this point? So I came to Cisco 14 years ago. I was actually at the time what they called a targeted hire. So I didn't go through the traditional, as you know, in Cisco, meet with 20 people, interview 300 times, and then five months later, you get a role. Um, I actually came in pretty quickly as this targeted hire for high-performance computing shortly after Cisco had acquired a company called Topspin. And so I came in as a data center PSS to focus on an InfiniBand interconnect that 18 months into the role, Sammy, they decided to de-emphasize the product. So I thought, oh no, what am I going to do with myself now? And one of the directors in federal reached out and said, hey, Shannon, would you be interested in going for an RM role in the federal space? And I threw my hand up and said, yeah, I would love to do that, primarily because it was the scientific space and I had been working in high-performance computing. I love that space. And to get to run the scientific region, I still stayed very connected to that community. And I felt like I could come in and make an impact because I did know that space pretty well. And I was there for several years. And I think, Sammy, that's one of the times I discovered purpose in my life. You know, I think sometimes we do these jobs because there are jobs. But if you can, at some point in time, connect it back to purpose and something that you love and something that you're passionate about, it makes for a very long day. And that connection to that community really inspired me and really helped to elevate me and how I showed up. And that's how I continue to kind of grow my career. And then you have one of those moments in life where you're like, OK, I could continue to be the scientific girl and federal, or do I have leadership skills? Have I created you know, a capability and a skill set that's actually portable into different parts of the business. And that's when I started to kind of expand up into out and look at different roles within the organization. And I became the director running all of civilian 
And then again, in order to continue to diversify, I reached up and raised my hand to run the state, local, and education business, which again, the connection to purpose, I used to tell teams all of the time in the SLED business, hey, you get to show up every day and make a difference in the communities that you live in, whether it's your neighborhoods or your school district. So go do that every day. Remember why you're here. Go make a difference. And um and then I had a conversation with my now boss, Jeff Sheritz, and I said, you know, I've been in public sector. I love the mission. I've been so connected to it for so many years. Now, you know, I feel like if there's an opportunity to really grow, I need to spread out of public sector. And it wasn't but a couple of uh, weeks, maybe a month or two later, that Jeff called me and said, hey, would you be interested in running a country? And I said, OK, what country would that be? And he said, Canada. And I said, I'm all in. I, I, I'd love to do that. And it's just been an amazing experience. This whole journey, this 14 years has been an amazing experience. I love working for this company and I love the teams that I've had the opportunity to serve. Wow. That is absolutely incredible. I can't wait to get that phone call one day, Shannon. Hey, do you want to run a country? Sure. Why not? Sounds fun. Well, <laughs> I mean, to your point, finding purpose is so incredibly important. And I feel like as a manager in the public sector space, that's the mindset, right, is we get to help our communities and our customers. Showing up at work doesn't really feel like a job when you are giving back and you love the people you work with. So I, I guess my follow-up question to you, and it kind of ties back to finding that purpose, why have you decided to stay at Cisco for over 14 years now? You know, Sammy, you know I'm a storyteller, so I will tell you this story because I think this story resonates for me. I had the opportunity a couple of years ago to meet with Chuck Robbins, as everybody knows, is the CEO of Cisco. And I was scared to death. I was like, I'm not going to have anything in common with him. At first, I kind of pushed back. I'm like, I don't want to meet with Chuck. And they're like, well, he wants to meet with you. So you better prepare and show up. And I sat down with him and we had this amazing conversation. And the thing that he said to me that really kind of resonated and just stuck with me, he said, you know, Shannon, I didn't take this job to run a great company, you know, I want to run a great company. I took this job to do what we all want to do and make a difference in the world. And for me, I was like, hell yeah. And I tell people, I give career advice and I mentor and I sponsor. And I'm like, God, at the end of the day, you really have to connect back to purpose. And for me, it was the same thing. I don't take a role and I don't show up unless I really believe that I can make a difference and make an impact. And the reason that I stay with Cisco is because to what Chuck said, I believe every day I get to get up and make a difference in the world. I believe that. My teams believe that. My customers believe that. And it makes me really love what I do. It's not that I don't have hard days. We all have hard days. But I'm so connected to that purpose and I'm so connected to that impact that it makes those hard days far and few. Yeah, absolutely. And you can hear it in the tone of your voice and your conviction that you truly believe that. And that's why leaders follow you, right? And take advice from you. So let's transition and talk about this new role, by the way, congratulations. We'll call it new, new-ish that you took over as president. Holy moly, congratulations. But <laughs> tell us, Shannon, for the listeners out there, like what falls under your umbrella? What does your day look like? I mean, talk to us about your responsibilities. Oh, it's what doesn't fall under my umbrella. You know, I tell you, as right. a sales leader within Cisco, you know, I had an amazing opportunity. And the last business I ran in SLED in the U.S., you know, it was a $2 billion business. I mean, it was just a huge book of business. When Jeff called me and asked me about running Canada, the thing that was so compelling about running Canada was was that running a country is very different than just running a sales organization. And while I have the sales organization, we still, I measure to the same things that I was measured to in every sales role I've been, been in, you know, execution, profitability, growth, those things are still really important. But now I get the opportunity to really reach out and grow myself professionally to work with marketing and corporate social responsibility. And in Canada, we have over 2,000 employees. There's only about 300 that roll up into me in the country. So how do I start to reach out across the country with all of those employees and start to really impact what are the needs of the country? What are the, some of the things that we can do across the organization to bring us all together? 
What are some of those individual organizational needs for the engineering organization, for the sales organization, for the architectures, for the CX organization? And how do we start to work together and leverage each other and leverage some best practices? And then again, when it gets down to the individual and the employee, how do we create a common experience across all of the employees? Now I get the opportunity to not just run a sales organization, but look at all of these other different areas. And Canada is such an amazing country to run. They had a great foundation in place when I came. And now Rola had done amazing work really creating kind of a social justice platform And I get that to take that platform and really extend it to how does Cisco now show up as an organization that not only does good for the country, but now has this platform of technology to better deliver services and applications and capabilities as we're going through this really hard time in the country and in the world. So we're looking at, you know, kind of our pandemic response and vaccine distribution. And then how do you take all of that to economic recovery? And what does that look like as new business models emerge? You know, I I get to look at the business really differently than just kind of a traditional sales leader. and, And I love it. You know, when I was going for the job and I was talking to people and getting some background, folks kept telling me country leaders, the best job in the country. And I tell you, Sammy, country leader is one of the best jobs in the country. I highly recommend it. Uh, <laughs> oh, good. A lot of okay. fun. I love that. What you just said folds into my next question perfectly, which is 2020 took all of us for a surprise. No one could have predicted the pandemic and we've had to adapt along with our customers and our partners in this virtual world and environment. How has your leadership style changed or evolved in this virtual world as you took over this new role? Like what's different for you now than before the pandemic? You know, I I think I did this to some degree, but now I really doubled down on transparency and open communication. It's never been more critical than it is right now. People need to know and want to understand what's going on. We have so many teams working from home and they need to make sure that those employees feel connected to Cisco and to our culture and to their leadership and to the teams. So really doubling down on transparency and communication. The other piece too is empathy. And I know Chuck talks about it. I know we talk about it, but you know, I was able to conduct a power of team session with my team. And you know, Sammy, these people I work with every day, I talk to them every day. And when I sat down and we did this powers of teams session, um, which is a virtual health kind of check-in, there were people in my organization and, and one person in particular who I consider a close friend who was really struggling and I had no idea. And I thought to myself, not only am I not showing up great as a leader, I'm not showing up great as a friend. And so the other thing for me was really important to take time with people and really pause and say, how are you? No, really, how are you? And take a moment to really kind of connect with that person to make sure that if they needed something, I was there and I could help them. And so empathy showed up in a a really different way. And I think, again, we get so caught up and I know people are tired and I know we're facing, and we talked about it in the check-in today, levels of burnout. Um, And I think it's so important for us as leaders sometimes just to pause and ask the question, really, how are you? The other thing that, you know, you can imagine what it's like, Sammy, to take over running a country and yet have a chance to actually set foot in the country. So that's been an interesting opportunity and challenge. And one of the things that I started to do was I set up these virtual roundtables with all the teams so I could find a way to meet them. And, you know, sometimes when you get on with a vice president or a president of a country, people get very nervous and they don't want to talk. And so we started off the roundtables with tell me your name and tell me a fun fact about yourself because I wanted to be really informal and really casual because if we had the opportunity to be in the office 
or having lunch or out for a cocktail together, we'd be able to have this kind of banter back and forth and get to know each other. And it's hard to create that space virtually. But I found that starting off with these fun facts, it's been really entertaining. I've learned so much about the teams. I've learned so much about Canada that I did not know. And I just, you know, you just try to find ways co to connect with people in new and different ways. And you don't stop trying, <laughs> you know, if, if right. something works, then that's great. And if it doesn't work, you try something else. But the biggest thing for me is the transparency, lots of communication and empathy. I mean, those are the top three. Absolutely. I can totally echo you there. And I did a check-in with my team last week and we were reviewing our culture amp survey results. And that's something that we scored really high on is that my leaders let me know what's going on in my organization. And that made me feel so proud because to your point, with COVID more than ever, our teams need to feel informed, right? They don't want to feel in the dark. And there are some things that, of course, we can't tell them, but when we can be as transparent as possible because that builds trust. And when we're not all in an office together, we need that, right? We need to cultivate a sense of trust. And you have to be super intentional about it. It's, it's not one of those things that you can think, oh, it'll just happen if I set up a bunch of calls. It doesn't work that way. You really have to be very thoughtful and very intentional about creating that space in some way, shape, or form, or however that shows up for you and your organization. And I think that's the piece that's different. It's the intentionality about it. 100%. Yes, echo that completely. Well, I want to transition, and I mentioned this in the intro, March is Women's History Month, and I'm doing little snaps with my fingers right now. You can't see me. Woohoo! And Cisco had tons of great sessions over the last two weeks to honor and celebrate. And Shannon, I mentioned this to you before we started recording. I attended the session you hosted called Beyond She, Her, and it was a conversation about creating welcoming spaces for women. And I was super, super impressed. It was a panel of Cisco LGBTQ plus women and allies talking about how do we cultivate a safe space? And it really made me think, what is possible when we as women uplift and empower other women so their voices are heard? So I want to ask you, who is a woman in your life that you've met throughout your career or it could be your personal life that has made a truly profound impact on your life and why? I tell you, Sammy, you know, that session that I had the opportunity and the honor to host last week was one of the honors of my career. You know, I think and I love the fact that Cisco does this is really lean into some of these conversations and have them because people need to hear them because people are struggling with this and nobody wants to feel like they're the only ones going through it. And I give Jennifer Wright out full credit. It was her vision to say, hey, I've got this idea. Would you guys sponsor it? And the women of the impact and the women of Cisco in Canada, teens kind of came together and, and saw her vision come to light. And it was just an absolutely amazing session. And I tell you, I give those women a lot of credit. It takes a lot of courage to stand up in front of an entire organization and tell your truth. And all of those women did that in a very profound way. Again, I'm just so thankful that they that Jennifer had the idea and that, and that we hosted that, that session. So thank you for bringing that up. When I think about women, so for Women's History Month, I've been sending out kind of a tweet or a LinkedIn kind of post on women that have inspired me. And some of them I think are inspirational because of their fame, right? Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Michelle Obama, Nellie Galan. For me, I think it's the women that have paved the path and done the hard work to continue to help elevate not only women, but other minorities and other you know groups to help them get to a next level. And all of those women have done that for me in some way, shape or form. And, and I honor women that are there just to do the hard work and just to do the right thing. I think in my life, if I had to think about myself, I would, Sammy, you know this story, and I'm going to say this story. I won't go into a ton of detail, but my oldest daughter, Hannah, had a situation in her life when she was young that could have turned her into a lot of different directions. And she never let that define her. And it's not that it wasn't hard, and it's not that we don't struggle with it, and it's not that it doesn't come up. But she has risen above that with such courage and such determination and such grace that if I had to say one woman, and she's 20 years old, she's a woman now, that I admire most is this child 
who overcame so much at such a young age to be such a strong woman and role model for others in the in the work that she's doing in university and the studies that she's taking to help other people. So personally, the one woman that I admire who's deep in my heart and soul would be my child, Hannah. Oh my gosh. Shannon, I have full body chills right now. Thank you for sharing that. And that's so beautiful and inspiring. And it comes from all the women around us, right? Younger, older, it doesn't matter age or experience. We all have valuable lessons to learn from each other. So thank you for sharing that and being vulnerable, first of all. I'm actually going to jump down to this question that I had for you because it plays into vulnerability. Remind me, are you familiar with Brene Brown? Have you read any of her books? Yes, I have. Dare to lead. Okay. Oh, woo. Love it. Okay. I'm a big Brene Brown buff. So you can't do an interview with me without some sort of question revolving around this. You were so vulnerable when you came and spoke at the Women of Meraki event. And it made me think a lot about powerful leaders. And I want to read you this Brene Brown quote and get your opinion and hear kind of the insights to how you operate as a leader, but Brene Brown, she's a professor, a lecturer, an author, right? Podcast host. But basically she's done, she has a PhD. She's done over 20 years in research on leadership, shame, and vulnerability. And here's what she says about her own experience. She said, I spent a lot of years trying to outrun and outsmart vulnerability by making things certain and definite, black and white, good and bad. My inability to lean into the discomfort of vulnerability limited the fullness of those important experiences that were wrought with uncertainty. Love, belonging, trust, creativity, and joy, just to name a few. Learning how to be vulnerable has been a street fight for me, but it's been worth it. And she goes on to say that we think denying our emotions makes us stronger and resilient, but the research shows that it actually makes us less resilient. So my question for you, Shannon, is what has been your journey regarding vulnerability and opening up to the people you lead? And how do you display vulnerability, but still keep boundaries? What does that balance look like? Tammy, that's a great question. And everybody would do themselves a huge service to either watch a Brene Brown podcast or read some of her books. You know, I I have this conversation a lot, certainly a topic of debate primarily brought up by Brene Brown. People view vulnerability as weakness. It is not, right? It takes much more courage to be vulnerable than it does to not be vulnerable. And I think for me, it came to fruition. And I don't know that I knew that I was being vulnerable when I started really talking about authenticity, right? Because as a leader and and certainly as a female leader, listen, I've been asked just like many others to look this way and dress this way and talk this way and come sit in this room and just look pretty, don't say anything. And again, none of that served me. None of that ever served me. So at the end of the day, I could only do me really, really well. And I became very comfortable in the fact that, listen, I'm going to be authentic. This is who I am. We'll do our due diligence on each other. If this doesn't work for you or the companies that I'm in, I'm okay with that. But at the end of the day, I've got to do me because that's the only person that I can do. And that's the only person that I can be. The second thing is it doesn't matter what title that you hold. We all have stories. You know, I just told you one of my stories. I stood up and gave a leadership talk not long ago. And again, it was an aha moment for me. When I looked at my life, it was a leadership discussion on your journey, your life journey. And they were sections of seven years. And when I looked across the seven years, the things that defined me were not happy things. They were usually tragic things or sad things. And again, I say this all the time, a true test of character is not how you do when things are going well, but how you rise to the occasion in adversity. And that speaks to resiliency and and perseverance. And I think, again, being able to share that is an act of vulnerability. And I think that people want to work for real people. You know, at the end of the day, people will follow real people because they relate and it's relatable and it builds that trust and that connection. And so I think kind of a long way of getting back to authenticity, but I think it starts with just being really comfortable with who you are and showing up that way and being okay with that. 
you know, with regards to having boundaries, I think that's really important because, you know, part of me as a leader, I'm a very passionate person. You know, sometimes there are times I know that I need to rein that in and that it's not the right discussion for the right time. You know, you've got to have some self-awareness on how you show up. The boundaries that I set, you know, this guy told me one time, his name is Wayne Valentine. He was my business partner in the federal space. And he said, Shannon, people always say, um, or I say this about you, that you lead with an iron fist and a velvet glove. Because the other piece, you know, is I'm a business leader and I want to be respected as a business leader. And I have a process and a methodology and a, an approach. And I have very high expectations for myself. I have very high expectations for my team. Again, I set that bar really high. So again, it's important for me to be clear on, you know, what my role is and my job and the expectations. But part of that also is that when I set those expectations um, and I can even be tough with people, they know it's coming from a good place and that I actually care. And again, it gets back to that authenticity. They know that while I might be being tough or we're having a tough conversation, they still know that I'm coming from a good place and I'm doing it for the right reasons. And so it's kind of finding that balance of being tough and setting expectations high but still being authentic and coming at it from, you know, you're trying to do fundamentally the right thing. And I think that's really important. Long answer to your question, Sammy, but a lot to unpack in that question because it's a hot topic that comes up quite a bit. And I think vulnerability is a key to success for all leaders. Absolutely. Yeah, it was a loaded question and a long one. So I appreciate the thoughtful response and I completely agree with you. Let me ask a follow-up question to that. Have you had to set boundaries with certain people who maybe look at your example and overshare or share too much? I mean, for uh, those folks listening today who are trying to find that balance or want to maybe become a leader, have you learned any lessons on like where to draw the line? I guess sometimes it can be hard for people to know. Yeah, that's a great question. I think the biggest thing comes to kind of emotional intelligence and self-awareness. I I think for me, there's a time and a place, and I think you just need to be very mindful about how and where you deliver those kinds of messages. Because I, I think that particularly now, Sammy, we've got so many people going through so much that now is a time, and I think the opportunity is best to really be vulnerable and to share and let people know what you have going on in your life. I I think that the most important thing is just be, you know, just be really cognizant of the time and the place. Those sessions are better had one-on-one in a private conversation with your leader and not kind of in an open group or with an open forum, unless you're doing something like I'm doing right now where we're talking about it specifically but I think it's just that self-awareness. Yeah, a hundred percent. That EQ, the emotional right. intelligence there. Right. Yeah. Um, so if I remember correctly, when you came to Meraki, you mentioned that you were a big reader. You always have like books on your United Stand or you're always reading another book. And I like to give our listeners something tangible to walk away with. So those folks out there who love to read, can you pick a book that has changed your perspective or help you become a better leader. Tell us what that book is and why. Oh, Sammy, I don't know that I could pick just one. So I might give a couple here. First of all, I am a huge reader, but I always split it up. So I do one fun book and then I do one business book. I alternate it because if you were reading business books all the time, but that would get kind of old. I just finished a new Stephen King book, by the way. So I love Stephen King. A little, um, little... I know, I know. It's like people, whenever I say that, people are like, really? And I'm like, yeah, really. But from a business perspective, you know, the book that really, and it's funny, I was running the scientific region at Cisco in the federal space, and I created a whole mantra and a theme for the team around this that kind of really changed how I showed up as a leader was, again, it's a leadership classic, Good to Great by Jim Collins. And it was, how do you take a good organization and make it a great organization? And greatness is defined over a period in the book, 15 years. And I thought that was such a great tangible book to really kind of think about, you know, how you lead and what does great look like and getting the right people on the bus and the right roles. Because for me, it really starts with people. So that was kind of a game changer for me, that book, Good to Great. Uh, The one that's top of mind right now, and, you know, Chuck 
uh, had a quarterly check-in with leaders, and he talked about this book. When I did my all hands with the Canadian team a couple of weeks ago, I said, hey, listen, I'm going to bring this book up. For anybody out there that's interested, I will buy this book for you, so please go get it. And that's Mindset by Carol Dweck. And I think that, you know, again, particularly now with all of the things that we have going on, we have to be in the right mindset and a growth mindset on how we show up for our business and for our teams, but also how we show up in our lives. And as a person that considers themselves, you know, very growth oriented, when I read the book, I had the fixed mindset around lots of different things. And it was really eye opening for me to read that book and just think about, you know, again, things that I could do and how I could show up differently. And the last one that I'll throw out there, because I think it's so good for everybody to read, particularly in the business setting, Cisco used to do a leadership development program with this as a component, but the book is called As We Speak by Peter Myers and Shannon Nix, and um, it's about high-performance communication. And it doesn't matter that if you're sitting on a podcast with Sammy or if you're standing up and delivering an all hands to 2000 people across Canada, or you're going in to have a conversation with your boss about a promotion or a raise, I think it's always important for us to focus on how we communicate in the business world and how we can show up our best. You know, you don't get a lot of opportunities in many cases for that kind of visibility. So prepare and do it well. And I think that, you know, communications is so important in our business and so important in our lives. I mean, you could even talk about high performance communication when you're communicating with your spouse if you want to buy a new car or a new house. But that was a great book. And again, another one of these books that I read where I had, you know, an aha moment of, oh, if I did that, I could show up differently and lead differently and I would be better because of it. So good to great mindset and as we speak are three go-tos for me. And when I lead and mentor people, those are three that I always recommend, always recommend. Okay. I took notes. I have a lot of reading to do, Shannon. (laughs) (laughs) I I haven't read any of them, but I've heard of all three of them and I heard mindset was incredible. So I think I'm going to start with that. Yeah. it's, It's really good. Really good. Okay. I love it. So we're going to wrap up. This is the last question I could ask you a million more, and then we'll end with a call to action. But I I wanted to get into your kind of your headspace and hear how you're thinking about Cisco and our path to innovation. I mean, it's, it's no surprise that the, the IT networking space is a saturated market. And I feel like new competitors, new cloud competitors are popping up left and right every day. So as a leader at Cisco, how are you thinking about innovation and our unwavering commitment to think differently and differentiate from our competitors? What's going on in your mind? Listen, I have this conversation a lot, Sammy. Sometimes I think the Cisco teams make it harder than it needs to be. And I'll get back to a little bit of what I talked about before. And again, I'll give you another example And this was from John Chambers, actually. We used to bring John in, and he used to do a CIO roundtable for a lot of the federal leaders when I was in the Fed space. And he used to sit down, and this was right before the elections with Hillary Clinton and and Trump. He said, regardless of the outcome, that there is going to be a national digital agenda, And he said it wasn't as prominent in the current administration, which was the Obama administration, but for the new administration coming in, there is going to be a focus on a digital agenda. And he talked about country digitization. He was talking about the work that he was doing with many countries with regards to improving health care, improving education, helping economic development in those countries, and how Cisco as a platform was aligned to delivering those capabilities. And I'm going to paraphrase here. Many of our customers have made these huge investments in Cisco in this platform. Are we really helping them leverage that to deliver the services and capabilities and applications that they need to? And he made it almost sound like, well, who else would you work with? You've already made this huge investment in Cisco. And for me, I thought it was such a powerful moment because anybody can go in and have that conversation. What we don't do a good enough job of at Cisco, in my opinion, as a sales organization, is really connecting to that why. What is your customer's biggest challenge and how are you helping them to solve for that? And so right now, you know, digital acceleration, I know we hear this, we talk about it all the time, is happening at a massive, massive rate. 
who else is going to help many of these organizations change their business model and transform? They've already made these huge investments in Cisco. It's our opportunity to go in and really talk about how they leverage that investment really for the greater good and for the ability to deliver new and better services now that we're in this new normal. And I think for me, it's as simple as that, is we need to get back and not necessarily be experts on the technology, but be experts on our customers and really help them solve for our biggest challenges. They need that help right now. And it's our opportunity to stand up and really do that in a much more pervasive way. We've got to stop telling, selling technology for the sake of selling technology and really start to answer the why. Mm-hmm. Preach. I love that answer. I so know. simple yet so complicated, right? We, we make it hard and, and Cisco has great technology, but we really, how do you get in the C-suite? You get in the C-suite by understanding these outcomes. And that's how we can, again, be wildly successful. So that's what we need to do more of is change the conversation and really answer the things that are top of mind to that C-suite. And it's not about a router or a switch or a phone. It's about what are their challenges and how do we help them solve for that? Just like, again, I mentioned healthcare, education, GDP, economic recovery. Those are the things and types of conversations that we need to be leading and having with our customers. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. And I think it's a really good reminder to bring it back, strip it down. It's more simple than we think. Let's be that expert that our customers come to, to really help solve problems and figure out what the pain point is and alleviate that pain point, right? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned, and we'll wrap this up. I want to end with a call to action for our listeners today. So you mentioned, Shannon, that you are a champion of Cisco's purpose to power an inclusive future for all. How do we as employees and listeners out there, whether you work at Cisco or Meraki or a different organization, how do we take one small step to do this today? Listen, I think powering an inclusive future for all, I think, Sammy, and again, we talked about this a little bit just in the beyond she, her conversation is, and again, I would also relate this back to the conversation we just had with regards to how we show up differently for our customers It's really about leaning into the conversations and leaning into the hard conversations, whether that hard conversation is really about how do we create more diversity in the organizations or the hard conversation is really setting up that meeting in the C-suite or with an executive or with a line of business that you haven't currently had those conversations with to really understand what their business needs are. Leaning into those conversations and just be curious, be curious. I love it. I think that's a beautiful high note to end this conversation. Shannon, thank you so much. I walked away with a wealth of information and also some homework to do. So thanks for that. And I'm excited to pick up those books, but truly your leadership, I have seen it firsthand, the way you speak to people, the ideas that you have. Uh, We are so fortunate to have you here at Cisco and leading Canada. And I cannot wait to see what you do with this new role. Thank you, Sammy. It was an honor and a pleasure to be here. I really enjoyed it. And thanks for the great conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. We'll go ahead and wrap it up today, folks. Another great episode of the Meraki Unbox podcast. I'll do it again. Here's another plug to go ahead and subscribe today if you haven't already done that. That way you stay up to date on the latest and greatest content that we're releasing about every two weeks. Be sure to stay safe out there and we'll wrap it up today. Take care. Take care.